neighborhood works and actions. Here are petitions and grant rest to our departed in your dwelling place of joy. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
have in the readings today, is essentially, as I mentioned to you last week, for many of the exegetes, these are the oldest texts of the New Testament. These are St. Paul's oldest letters, writing to the people in Thessalonica. And what we can clearly see is that it is a love letter. St. Paul is in awe, we can say, of respect and affection for what God has accomplished to the Thessalonians. That what the Holy Spirit has accomplished in Thessalonica among these people in their response that not only that they transform and, as he said, turn 180 degrees from idols in their conversion, but that he also, in the transformation of their souls, they became an example. And therefore, he says, the gospel was spread throughout Achaia and Macedonia because of you. It's basically almost the, all of the rest of what's now modern day Greece. We're not told. They certainly didn't start websites. They certainly didn't do pamphleteering. They were not done knocking door to door. It's because of what they became with the presence of the Holy Spirit in which we're told they received it in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Now the word conviction in its origin of meaning is made up of the Latin word for conquering. So when we speak of conviction, it's the fact that these people have opened themselves to be, in a sense, overwhelmed by the grace of God within them. This is a choice they make. God is only presenting His gift through St. Paul. Remember last week, the entrance, the entrance that I have among you, the isodos. So this entrance among you, the grace is presented, how do you respond? The Corinthians responded by fighting among themselves and grabbing the gifts of God as if they belonged to them properly. The Thessalonians, on the other hand, they turn from their idolatry, they turn from their selfishness, they turn from their egoism, and they turn towards this gospel of God that St. Paul can say, you became imitators of us, the apostles, and of the Lord himself. And in this transformation, you become the radiant source of the gospel throughout the rest of Greece. We have to always remember that Christianity is an incarnational religion. But the hidden God of all eternity, the hidden Father, who reveals Himself in the hidden Son through the Incarnation, that our Lord Jesus Christ speaks to us, and the Word is given to us, that always remains at the level of the Syriac Fathers of Rose. Remember that our proper term for the mysteries is Rose. Mysteries we tend to use because we're Easterners. But mysteries is no less our word that is the word sacrament. They both have their values and their meanings in the Greek world, in the Latin world. But in the Eastern world, rozo is the ancient Persian word for council of the emperor, the Shah and Shah, the king of kings. And the Syrian fathers decided to take this term, St. Ephraim, Afrata. They take the term Rosa of the counsels of the divine king of the hidden one who reveals to us his plan. And so hence the word for our mysteries, whether it is the sacramental mysteries that we speak about, or even for St. Ephraim, even the things in this world, at a different level of course, but are all Rosa. God is communicating to us through all the events and the moments of creation and in the events of our lives. It's a very important understanding that this contact with our Lord, unless you eat the flesh of Son of Man, you shall not have life within you. Unless you be baptized, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. These terms, this necessity of what? Pouring water. Of what? Eating bread. These little things are the contact points by which grace is spread. And it's something which I tend to think we have, we tend to forget. It's not God in heaven who just simply works miracles everywhere and grace is given to people. The hidden God of all eternity, the Ancient of Days, has chosen to reveal Himself in His Son. And that incarnational aspect means that grace is spread incarnationally. 
The work of redemption, ultimately, what it means for us individually is it is spread from person to person. It's spread quite dramatically through the priesthood, through the baptism, through the divine mysteries of the altar, through the Eucharist, through baptism, participation, and all the others. But it is also communicated through us as baptized individuals. Now God has made this fundamentally very easy for most of us by the idea that most of us get married and have children. And the communication of that faith is meant to be from us to our children. They're little sponges. They absorb everything. They pick up all of our bad habits, too. And when they hit 40, they realize, oh my gosh, I'm becoming my father. <laughs> so because they absorb everything when they see it. And in God's plan for the sacrament of matrimony, it was meant that that gospel grace was to be transmitted to the next generation, to the children. Now what we see with the Thessalonians and the reason why St. Paul is so profoundly in love with these people is because he sees grace working at its full capacity by people who have been generous to respond for that conviction. On Judgment Day, I think that one of the very first questions that will be asked of us in that divine light and justice is will be for us to point out minimally two people who have come to redemption and the grace of the gospel through me, through us in the judgment. And that aspect is because of the communication which is given to us of grace. Redemption is not meant for us alone. But the redemption is meant to be communicated in this life to others. So in that divine light at that moment of our death, we will be asked, and who else has benefited from the grace that I gave you? Who has heard the gospel because of your fidelity? Who has come to the redemption because of your loyalty and your conviction? Who has seen grace flourish in your existence? And we will be held accountable for that because the gifts of God are given in great generosity that are meant to flow through us. And the Thessalonians in this first chapter brilliantly show that. It's beautiful. And so what we have to ask for today is the grace that we truly have a profound desire to imitate the apostles. To have this zeal of gratitude of the grace that is given to us. And the zeal for the desire that that conviction that we have in communication. Now it doesn't mean that we're knocking on doors. It doesn't mean that we're wearing a sandwich board over at the main intersections. But what it means is that we live a life which is so transformed by this presence of the Spirit of God. That it attracts to the light of those around us. That's what it primarily means. When we have met people in whom grace is profoundly transforming their existence, there is a profound peace. And everyone in the world desires peace. It's one of the reasons why we have this huge opioid drama going on. Nationally, we are people without orientation or any sense of direction. And that emptiness within our lives, we try to fill. We fill it with fun. We fill it with entertainment. We fill it with all of our electronic gizmos. And when we keep throwing it within us, nothing happens. And the only thing that we come to realize is the chasm and the quasi-infinity for which the human soul, the human spirit is opened. Because it is meant to be created, and it is created for the hidden one of all eternity. So no matter what we throw in there, it will always be unsatisfactory. So we drown ourselves in alcohol, we look for escapes through drugs, that are all managed to escape from the emptiness that we find. This is not a chemical problem. This is ultimately a spiritual problem, racking our nation. The Thessalonians 
have shown us a different path. These people, many of them are Jews, but many of them are pagans converted to the gospel. And they have turned from that idleness and those limited. The word idol doesn't mean a statue of Athena. The word idol just means an image. Those things that we are attracted to, that we think that they are beautiful, we think that they're satisfying, and they're not satisfying. The word satisfying from its Latin origin means it accomplishes and does enough, satis. And that's precisely what we find out. They are not enough. They are not satisfying. And they reveal that emptiness. So the grace that we pray for today to imitate the apostles is because we see in these men and these women the transformation of what God can do of satisfaction, of what He can accomplish, which is truly a knowledge in the human life, of the conversion of grace and transformation, and through that radiant light of transforming our lives individually, that conviction will radiate out to others. And when that is done, we have no fear of the day of our death, but the question will be asked of us, and how many others have benefited from the gifts and the grace and the love that I have shown you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen.
You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing the pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out to glorify and proclaim. Let us stand with reverence 
compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with purity and holiness, to call upon you praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
Again and again, we thank you, O Lord, and praise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O Lord, of all people, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, O Thank you, Lord God and Father. And we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son, and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So for induction and bolts, literally, announcement. So after having our beautiful ceremony in Brooklyn for Lady FIFA and her investiture into the Order of St. Gregory on Friday, Upon returning, Larry Mitchell told me that our elevator is dying. And so, we have already spent about $1,500 since the beginning of the year fixing this gadget and this piece falling off. We know how it's like, we all age, right? So, he told me on Saturday we have another $2,000 bill for this elevator that's coming up. That has to, I told him that we just can't fix it right now until we raise that money. We are already over $20,000 in debt. 
And so as you realize, everyone goes to camp in the summer, and they are out of sight, out of mind. But our bills are exactly the same. We pay our eating bill 12 months of the year. We pay $1,200 a month for oil that we use for 10 months. So, or eight months. So we have all of these bills, but now the elevator, who's been here for 30 years and has served you well, needs a $2,000 facelift. And so it's a number of things that have broken off and they're coming for the inspection. So I just announced that to you two weeks ago. I told you the community office died. Doubtless in another three weeks, I'll tell you something else that's died or fallen apart. It's just the way life goes, right? So I'm very sorry. But if you talk to anyone who's enjoying camp and having their margaritas in some pond somewhere, remind them that we are still here and that we are still been here for 90 years. So the building pieces are falling off. We have the bills. So please remember that for next week. And then, like I said, poke them in between sips of their margaritas and let them know what's going on. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one